Today, I want to share something that might save your career. And I'm not exaggerating. If you are a PySpark developer, I'm going to talk about object-oriented programming. For almost a decade, I've been working with PySpark, building data pipelines, analytic solutions, and pretty much everything you can imagine with big data. And here's my confession. For most of the time, I actively avoided object-oriented programming with PySpark. Many of you and myself who came from SQL background, I found comfort in creating temporary views from data frame and then falling back to SQL syntax. It worked great for my projects. My teams were happy and everything was fine until it wasn't. This video is about my journey, my realization during job interviews and why you absolutely need to learn basics of object-oriented programming for PySpark. Even if you think that you don't need it, trust me, you should learn at least the basics. Let me take you back to about three years ago. After working for some company, I just thought, okay, let me try giving interviews outside. So I updated my resume, highlighting my extensive PySpark experience, and I started applying. So I got callbacks almost immediately. My experience was solid. I knew the PySpark API inside and out, and I could optimize Spark jobs with my eyes closed. So I was confident. Then came the technical assessments. One by one, I started facing a pattern. Coding platforms like LeetCode or HackerRank they have a pre-created method stubs that I need to implement. Now the instructions were clear. Complete these methods to make the PySpark application work. So I was looking at something like this. Felt a moment of panic. This wasn't how I typically write PySpark code. Where were my SQL queries? Luckily, I had some Java background. So I was not completely lost with OOP concepts. I managed to complete the assignments, but it was a wake-up call. The reality hit me. Professional PySpark world, especially during the interviews, OOP isn't optional. It is expected that you understand the concept. And it makes sense also, because when you think about it, the production grade applications need to be maintainable, testable, and scalable all the things that OOP supports. So today, I want to help you avoid that moment of panic by walking through three different approaches to write PySpark applications. We'll start with the sequential one, we'll switch to the functional style, and then we'll switch to the OOP style of writing PySpark application. For the sequential style, it's the most basic approach, which I think most of us follow especially when we move from SQL to Spark background, we just write code line by line, top to bottom. It is straightforward approach of writing code, but it can become complex as it grows. The second style is the functional style, where you leverage functions to organize codes into logical chunks. This adds structure and reusability, making your code more manageable. And the third style, is the object-oriented style, where we use classes and objects to encapsulate logic and state. This is the most structured approach and one of the most frequently expected in professional environments. When I used to give interviews seven, eight years back for PySpark, most of those interviews were more like asking the questions verbally and then giving the answers, telling about the optimization technique in Spark, but there were not many hands-on environment where you can actually log in and you can create PySpark applications during your interviews. There were some platforms where I used to go and write Python programs. I used to write SQL queries. But in the last three, four years, there are many platforms available in the market that allows you to log in and write PySpark application as part of interviews. And the expectation is you have to code it in an object-oriented style. So your sequential may not work as this because there are some unit tests which are associated with each module or the objects or the methods. So if you are writing it in a sequential manner, the unit test won't be able to pass. 
So that's why object oriented programming is actually very important. So what we are going to do now is we are going to create a very simple ETL pipeline where I will be reading two CSV files from S3 bucket. I will transform, I will apply some joins and aggregations to the data and then I will store the data back into S3 location in Parquet format. This I will do in AWS Glue, but you can run it in some other platforms as well. The idea is not about the PySpark code, but more about the style in which you write the code. So we'll start with a sequential manner, we'll switch the same code to functional manner, and then finally we'll switch the code to object-oriented programming style. I have accessed my AWS account and created source and target directories within S3. The source directory contains two CSV data files, while the target directory is empty currently, and we'll store generated Parquet files in it. I will demonstrate creating three glue jobs, first implementing the sequential approach. So let's begin with the sequential job implementation. And here we can see the boilerplate AWS glue code. I will name the job as sequential and proceed with the implementation. First, I will create a data frame to load the initial CSV file from our source location. Next, I will generate a second data frame to process the products data.csv file. With both data frames created, I will join them and perform aggregation operations on the combined data set. Finally, I will write this aggregated data set back into S3 in Parquet format. For job configuration, I will modify the IM role and I'll set maximum workers to two. I'll change the timeout to five minutes to prevent unnecessary execution if error occurs. Now we'll save the job and trigger it. Let's check the status and I see the job has failed with an execution error. I know what is the problem. So we are using some functions here in aggregation method. Uh, which I have to import. The default glue boilerplate co code does not include the required PySpark SQL functions like sum, when, column. So I will import it now and that should resolve this error. Let me save the job run and run the job now. So the job is running again. Hopefully this time it should be successful. While the sequential job is running, let me create a, another job. And this time this job is for functional programming implementation. Again, I will go to script editor. I'll keep the engine as spark and I'll start fresh. I see the boilerplate code. So the functional approach will maintain the identical logic but I will restructure the code into discrete functions for improved modularity. And I am proactively importing the PySpark SQL functions to avoid encountering the same error. I will name the job as functional and I will configure the IAM role and worker count as before. Let's have a look at the sequential job execution. So in sequential job, we initialize the Spark session. We created two data frames. We join the data frame and we done some aggregation and return it back. So the functional code will follow the same identical logic, but we'll refactor everything as part of a function rather than having a standalone code block. Let's check the status of the sequential job run now. And I see the job is completed this time. Let's check the target S3 bucket that whether the Parquet files were generated. And I see that there are some Parquet files generated. So the code is working fine without error. Now for the functional implementation, instead of writing sequential steps, I will create individual functions for each operation. 
So the very first function is to initialize the Spark session. So having a, instead of having a standalone structure or a code base, I will put everything inside functions. So I created the func first function here, create Spark session and all that Spark initialization and job initialization I put into this function and it returns Spark session. The next step is to read the CSV file into data frame. And there is a lot of code duplication in the sequential job. So I'm doing a very similar task, similar code, but I have to write it two times. Now I will create a function to read the CSV file into data frames and by eliminating code duplication. So it will take some input parameters. The next step was to join the data frame. So again, I will create a new function that will join two data frames. The next step was to perform aggregation operation. So again, I will create a function that will do aggregation. And after which I will create a function that will write this data into Parquet format. Lastly, I will create the main function that will orchestrate the execution flow. So you can see here inside the main function, I am calling all the previously created functions one by one. So this orchestrates it. And this approach significantly improves code reusability. For example, rather than writing similar data frame creation code multiple times for each CSV file, we now have a single function that accepts file path as parameter. So I'll save the job and I will trigger this glue job as well. And I can see the job is running. So the functional logic is exactly the same. Only thing is we have put everything within a function which has increased the reusability of the code. And I see the functional job is also successful now. So I'll go into the S3 bucket to verify. I see the folder is created and I can see the parquet file inside. So the code is working fine. It is able to generate the parquet files by reading two CSV files. Finally, I will transform the functional code into an object oriented programming paradigm. I'll create new glue. I'll create a new glue job using Spark as the engine. Now this time we'll create a class. Before that, let me proactively import the SQL functions to avoid the error. Now again here, instead of having everything in functions right away, I will first create a class. Let's call it sales analyzer. And in this, I have to create an init method first. So the very first step was initiation of Spark and the job. So we'll do the same thing here also in object oriented programming as well, but we'll put this inside a init function. So underscore underscore init method, it initializes the objects and it creates a Spark session. You can see the create Spark session starting with underscore, which means that it is a private method that is used only for internal operations. This is a very good coding practice. When you start the function name with underscore, it denotes that it's a private method and should be used within the class only. Next step was to create the CSV uh, data frame. So I will use a similar function here as well. The next step was to create the join data frame. And this is very much similar to the functional code, right? So I am creating, joining the data frame, I'm doing the aggregation, and then I'm writing the data frame back into S3 in Parquet format. And this should look very much similar. Now here I have created another method, process sales data, which actually, if you see, is orchestrating the work which main function was doing in the functional code. This method is doing exactly the same function. It is orchestrating the other public functions within the class. And in main, I will create an object of the class first. So as soon as the object is created, the init method is called, it will create a Spark session, and then it will call the key method, which is process sales. And I will pass the arguments here, the input path for the two source files and the target path where we'll write the parquet file. And that's it. So that's how you can see how easily we have converted our functional code into a more uh, organized manner following the OOP principles. So I will set the I am role. I will change the workers. I will save the job and I will run it. So this structures enhances maintainability by establishing clear relationship between functions through the class hierarchy.
and the job is successful let me go into s3 and see the data and i see the parquet files have been generated so the code is running fine So through this demonstration, we evolved our PySpark code from a sequential implementation to functional programming and finally to an object-oriented structure. And each approach maintains identical business logic but with progressively improved code organization. The OP implementation represents production-grade code that is more scalable, maintainable and testable. Make sure that you understand this basics, at least this much basic of object-oriented programming. That's it for hands-on exercise. Why object-oriented programming matters in interviews? First, object-oriented programming demonstrates your software engineering fundamentals. It shows you are not just a data analyst who can write SQL queries, but a developer who understands software design principles. Secondly, the professional code base needs to be maintainable. As project grows, OOP provides structure that scales with complexity. Third, Testing becomes much easier with object-oriented programming. You can mock dependencies and test components in isolation. Finally, it enables team collaboration. With clear interfaces between components, team can work on different parts of the applications without stepping on each other's work. When I realized this during the interviews, it completely changed my approach to PySpark development. Now, I built all my production code using OOP principles only. Let me wrap this up with some practical advice. If you are from SQL background, like me, I know OOP might feel unnecessary or even intimidating at first. But trust me, investing time to learn these principles will pay off enormously, both in your daily work and especially during job interviews. Start by refactoring some of your existing scripts into classes. Practice identifying what should be a class, what should be an attribute, and what should be a method. Remember, you don't need to rewrite everything in OOP style. But for production grade code, definitely for interviews, OOP is the way to go forward. Thanks for watching this. If you find this helpful, please like, subscribe and share with other PySpark developers who might benefit. Drop your questions in the comments below and I will see you in the next video.